Good morning, everyone. I'm Nathalie Vess, a recruitment manager in the executive MBA team uh, at Home Lyon Business School. And I'm pleased today to welcome you to our first episode of our brand new masterclass series. I'm delighted to welcome Thomas Gauthier, our excellent professor of sustainable futures. Thank you, Thomas, for accepting to lead this masterclass and give a test of sustainable futures. Um, briefly, you are professor and sustainable futures course director at EM Lyon since 2016. And your research focuses on organizational anticipation, decision making, and action in uncertain environments. You published in 2020 a book, Prospective, Anticiper, Decider, et Agir dans l'incertitude. And we can listen to you in your podcast, Remarkable, every 15 days. You explore with your guests a possible future to build a sustainable future. Uh, today, the topic of your masterclass, Safeguarding the Future, or How to Get Corporate Strategy to Engage with the Anthropocene. Thank you, Thomas. We are listening to you. Well, thank you very much, Nathalie, and uh, welcome, everyone. I hope that you will find this uh, masterclass to be enjoyable. So the title is um, Safeguarding the Future. And before getting into the future, we are actually going to spend some time in the past, diving into history and focusing on a specific period in the 20th century where our history of the day begins. So right before the 70s is the year 1969. Some of you may remember, or maybe some of you were in Woodstock, 1969 with this quote from Jimi Hendrix, Altogether, the participants at uh, Woodstock Festival were very close to touching the truth, the peace and love truth. Now, let's get into Act 1 of today's Masterclass, from the Friedman Doctrine to the official future. Just one year after the Woodstock Festival, there was an article written in the New York Times by Milton Friedman, in which he reminded the readers, that there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. For those of you who don't know Milton Friedman, he is one of the leaders of the School of Chicago that put together the theoretical foundations for the neoclassical economics. There is another very important turning point, still in the 1970s. Now we are on Labor Day, September 2nd, 1974. President Gerald Ford is in office and he enacts the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Now this may sound like a very technical measure that the Ford government took back in 1974, but in fact, it is the opening act of the financial, let's say, uh, overtake of global economy. Because from the September 2nd, 1974, up until now, and probably going forward, the pension funds are asked to go and invest the employees' money in companies from around the world. This is the time in history when one may say that the global financial economy began. And I was uh, presented with this date by my esteemed colleague at EM Lyon, Professor Pierre-Yves Gomez. Let's fast forward again the uh, 1970 decade. Now we are in 1979. Margaret Thatcher becomes the first woman elected as the head of a European government in the United Kingdom. In the very early 1980, she delivers a speech, and during the speech, she uses the now famous phrase, I believe people accept there is no real alternative. The time when Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the US a bit later were elected into office is the time when the official future structured by economic growth became enforced in the most powerful countries in the world. There is no alternative. 
there is one and only one official future that we will all be following at whatever cost. This idea of a one future is now also used, developed, and put into action by very famous entrepreneur Elon Musk. Shortly after he explained publicly his wish to buy Twitter, the social network, he said to a journalist that my strong intuitive sense is that having a public platform that is maximally trusted and broadly inclusive is extremely important to the future of civilization. Elon Musk, according to his words, is concerned with the future of civilization. This official future, which got started in the 1970s, according to Musk, shall continue. The growth of human beings should even go beyond planet Earth, as you see on the image, and you all know that Elon Musk is at uh, the head of uh, SpaceX. Elon Musk is, through his acquisitions and entrepreneurial ventures, building the blocks that are necessary for an extraterrestrial civilization to emerge. Now let's move on to Act 2, the consequences of going down the path of this official future, the great acceleration. 1973, I think at this point of the masterclass you all recognize how important the 1970 decade has been for where we are at today in 2022. 1973, again, is the time of the first oil crisis. Now, I thought I would share with you images of oil drillings, etc., but I thought it was more interesting to show you folk singer Joan Bez, who on November 25, 1973, was in Montreux, Switzerland, and she had to ride a horse from her hotel to the concert hall because this was one of the three Sundays during which the federal administration of Switzerland banned the use of cars to save the oil reserves of the country. This is a very practical implication of the first oil crisis in Switzerland for the uh, US uh, folk singer Joan Bez. Now I fast forward history a bit and we turn to a contemporary witness. His name is Nate Hagens. You may have not heard of him yet, although he hosts a very interesting and mind-boggling show called The Great Simplification. Nate puts it like this, we are alive during the carbon pulse. What he means by that is that we are, as human societies, living in a civilization that is by and large working thanks to the unprecedented availability of fossil fuels. But according to Hagens, and of course according to geologists, this carbon history is going to have an end. Hence, he calls it a carbon pulse. We are in the middle of the carbon pulse, according to Nate Hagens, and now, in order to sustain our uh, level of consumption, we increasingly turn to debt. We increasingly turn to debt to spend resources from the future. Debt has become our primary lever for deciding that we will consume today and pay tomorrow, quoting Nate Hagens. By this time also of the masterclass, you shall have recognized that the editorial line, if you will, of it is for you to meet with people. You've met with Jimi Hendrix, You've met with Gerald Ford, you've met with Milton Friedman, you've met with Margaret Thatcher, you've met with Joan Bez, and now you're meeting with Nate Hagens. Well, let's go back into our most favorite 1970 decade. Now we are in 1972. 1972 is the year when the Limits to Growth report was published by MIT scientists that you see on the image. MIT scientists that worked very hard at building a world model. They put together their best understanding and knowledge of systems dynamics to model 
the world, to model the possible futures of humanity. And they came to a very clear conclusion that I am going to read out loud for you. If the present, remember this is back in 1972, if the present growth trend is world population, industrialization, food production and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years, with a potential consequence being a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. Year 1972, the report was published. It turned into a best-selling book. However, it was put on the side and the official growth-based future that I have discussed before, remember Friedman, remember Thatcher, has won. Let's fast forward again. MIT scientists were concerned with the future of humanity. So are the United Nations and so is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, also known as GIEC in French. June 2022, the IPCC chair says the following, levels of warming are at a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet and the next few years offer a rapidly closing window to realize a sustainable, livable future for all. So in other words, he concludes, based on the work by the IPCC scientists, that there is no time to waste. Now if more time is wasted, there is another official future that might very well come true, that is the future of collapse, which is the other very strong narrative of the contemporary times. On the one hand, you have an Elon Musk-like official future where technology is going to save us one way or another. And on the other hand, you have a collapse future narrative, which is telling us that no matter what we do, civilization, the way we know it, is going to come rapidly to an end. Now I'm offering you to meet with uh, Professor Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, who both wrote a book which is a history taking place in 2393 and explaining to the readers how the Western civilization collapsed. Naomi Oreskes, for those of you who are interested in looking her up, is Professor of History of Science at Harvard University. Now, there is another very interesting thinker who is summarizing her appreciation of the current times. Canadian essayist and whistleblower Naomi Klein says the following, climate change is a failure of imagination. We've been possibly, according to her, too focused on our official growth-based future to recognize that this official future was a dead end. Climate change is a failure of imagination, is a failure of imagining alternative futures. So let's start Act 3 of this masterclass, which I called Searching for a Safe and Just Space for Humanity. And I'll say to you in a few minutes where this quote is coming from. Well, searching for safe operating space for humanity was embodied by the work of Johan Rockström and many other scientists from the Resilience Center in Stockholm, Sweden. Their work concluded that there are nine planetary boundaries that humanity should respect and within which human activities should be deployed. Johan Rockström would say the planetary boundaries present a set of nine boundaries within which humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. This is the safe operating space. Now companies are starting 
to try and deploy their activities within this safe operating space, for instance, by recording their CO2 emissions that are heavily linked with the prospect for aggravated climate change. So you may see from the organizations that you are operating in that they are starting to produce an effort to reconnect with those planetary boundaries. Now, Kate Rayworth, here is another person that I am pleased to introduce to you, Kate Ray Rayworth, the British economist, introduced the concept of donut economics. And she asks us to think of it as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century with the aim of meeting the needs of all people with the means of living planet. So she essentially builds upon the planetary boundaries that were introduced by Johan Rockström and his team, but she adds a layer to this. She adds a bottom line that we shouldn't cross to ensure that the social foundations are respected. She says that not only should the operating space for humanity need to be safe, but it also has to be just. So the concern that Kate Rayworth is putting forward is that of maintaining inequalities below an acceptable level. And now you see also where this phrase safe and just space for humanity is coming from. Now, in 2022, there are companies that are acting at the forefront of building this safe and just operating space for humanity. One example, which was heavily covered by the media in the last few weeks, is that of Patagonia. Patagonia founder Yvon Chouinard wrote a letter to the Patagonia employees, starting with this simple phrase, Earth is now our only shareholder. And I'm sparing you the details here of what he did, but to make it short, he gave his stocks in the Patagonia company to a non-profit foundation whose aim is to safeguard life on Earth. And to continue on with the quote by Chouinard, he would say that if we have any hope of a thriving planet, much less of a business, it is going to take all of us doing what we can with the resources we have. And you probably see right there the chiasm with the official future that an entrepreneur like Elon Musk is supporting, which is based upon the prospect for acquiring additional resources from space. Space exploration is no more about going further and further into our knowledge space. Space exploration is about having access to new resources to sustain the same old official future. There are additional landmark events that we should be paying attention to. Again, this may sound a bit technical for you, and it may have been unnoticed because it took place during the COP27 in Egypt, but on the 10th of November of this year, the European Parliament adopted new reporting rules for multinationals. You may ask yourself, okay, what is the connection between accounting and safeguarding the future? Or what is the relationship between accounting and operating in a safe and just space for humanity? Well, the connection is rather simple to understand. Accounting is the function inside a company that allows the company to record the wealth that it is generating. Today, accounting records only the financial wealth that a company is generating. With the directives that was voted on by the European members of parliament earlier this month, accounting standards, the rules that all companies operating in Europe should follow, must 
include not only recording financial wealth, but also social wealth and environmental wealth. In other words, if those accounting standards are adopted, there is no way anymore for companies to do any harm to the biosphere, any harm to the ecosystems, because these harms will be recorded, will be made available for stakeholders, including investors. Companies will be accountable not only for their financial wealth generation, but also for the footprint they have on living ecosystems. Here's the challenge of our times. Safeguarding the future is about building peace between the biosphere, life on Earth, and the anthroposphere, the man-made environment. Think of companies, think of states, think of non-profit organizations as all having to work together to build peace between the biosphere and the anthroposphere. This is where we are at today. Now, there are probably many ways to build peace between the biosphere and the anthroposphere. And what is most necessary for all of us is to inquire, is to explore, is to research ways in which this peace may be achieved. And that may take searching and talking with remarkable people. Remarkable people is a phrase that was coined by Pierre Vac, who was the founder of strategic planning at Shell back in the 1970s. And according to Professor Rafael Ramirez at the University of Oxford, remarkable people, those people that I strongly encourage you to look for and talk with are intellectual entrepreneurs who open up new frames of reference that tempt our curiosity. They are early detectors of a new, still emergent future possibility. They see the world differently. They are willing to embrace alternative narratives. They are willing to challenge the official future. And they, in turn, help you as individuals grow your appreciation of the variety of pathways that humanity can take to rebuild peace between the biosphere and the anthroposphere. Up on the screen here, you see an example of such a remarkable people that I had the pleasure of interviewing a couple of weeks ago, Gaia Harrington. She wrote an update to the limits to growth. Remember the MIT scientist report, which was published in 1972. And for those of you who are interested in meeting more people, more remarkable people, well, just go outside, look up those vocative individuals that you find the worldview of to be of interest. My own journey and search for remarkable people is taking the form of a podcast, as Natalie was saying during the introduction, but your quest for meeting with remarkable people may be very different from mine. We're getting towards the end of today's story with Act 4, Designing Memories of the Future. This may sound like a weird phrase. I'm going to try and make it clear for you and reconnect also why designing memories of the future is a must-needed competence for acting towards more peace between the biosphere and the anthroposphere. Here are a couple quotes from Professor Case van der Heiden from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Designing memories of the future involves designing stories. And for some of us working in the business world, we are somewhat skeptical that stories are rigorous, that stories are of a professional grade. But in fact, stories, as van der Heiden puts it, are efficient vehicles for organizing things in our mind. 
When we want to engage with the complexity of the world, one can easily recognize that no single plot is going to be sufficient to embrace the full complexity of the world. We need stories, we need qualitative narratives that allow us to relate data across a wide range of subjects, disciplines and compartments. There shall be no limit in the exploration that we're on to design new narratives for the future. They are not going to come solely from what sociology tells us. They are not going to come solely from what earth science tells us. Stories for the future have to be in a way agnostic and bring together data across multiple disciplines. Von der Heiden also says something very powerful to me. The present is always a blur. We feel oftentimes disoriented in the present, not being able, sometimes at all, to make sense of what is happening to us. That could be news in the media, that could be professional events, whatever else is coming to us, oftentimes is just not making sense. So, von der Heiden offers us to engage in storytelling, developing stories, developing narratives to create order out of chaos, to grow our ability to sense and make sense of novelty, but also to grow our ability to establish a new pathway which is not strictly aligned with the official growth-supported future that I've been talking about now for the first 30 minutes of this masterclass. There are multiple people around you and around the world that are heavily engaged in designing new narratives for the future, in responding in a way to the call for action that Naomi Klein puts it as climate change is a failure of imagination. Here is one example, and I've taken three examples of people that are involved in the pedagogical team for sustainable futures at EM Lyon. Example number one, Nicolas Glusman co-designed Near Futures as a collective that, as he puts it, explores the imaginary worlds of transition. Every day, if not every hour, we hear something about the energy transition, we hear something about the ecological transition. And very often, whatever is connected with the transition is technology-oriented. The debate between nuclear energy and fossil energy, the debate between using electric vehicles or other kinds of vehicles. Well, those debates are possibly not bold enough. They do not engage sufficiently with the alternative futures. They do not ask us to deeply reflect on how much society could be reconfigured so that ultimately peace is achieved between the biosphere and the anthroposphere. To center the transition debates only around technology is a huge mistake. Here is another example. The Plurality University Network is a non-profit organization that brings together artists with business persons. The rationale for building connections between those two communities is that on the one hand, business people are very well aware of the power relationships that exist inside organizations, in between organizations, at the level of a country, or perhaps at the level of global economies. They know those power relationships very well. They know how to navigate the power relationships very well. They know the rules of the game very well. On the other hand, the artists are best at imagining new rules of the game, offering spaces to rethink 
the guiding principles according to which the market economy is structured. So now if you mix together artists with business person, you have the perfect combination of tactical and strategic knowledge and imagination capabilities. And up on the screen you see Katie Stewart that I had the pleasure to interview also in the podcast, who is the current president of the Plurality University Network. Here's another example, two amazing ladies, Anne Gallienne and Laureline Chopard. During the first lockdown, remember this was in 2020, they created a collective effort called Les Passeurs, which is all about developing new narratives for the mountain life of tomorrow. They've brought together professionals representing the ski lift operators, like for instance Compagnie des Alpes. They've brought together elected officials, for instance mayors of ski resorts. They've brought also housing development professionals, non-governmental organizations working towards protecting the mountain and altogether these people that are genuinely interested in building a sustainable future for the mountains imagined a plurality of alternative futures. They opened the box of the official more growth-based future to imagine how mountains could be transformed in such a way that, again, in high altitude, peace be regained between the biosphere and the anthroposphere. Aside from these examples, here at EM Lyon, we are also bringing in many organizations that have expressed an interest in designing new narratives for the future, in trying out their strategies when faced with unexpected futures. This is just a short list, this is not the full list of organizations that agreed to offer case studies to executive MBA participants at EM Lyon within the Sustainable Futures Certificate. What is to be remembered from this slide? Certainly not the exact names of every single organization, but rather that there are large companies, there are small companies, there are for-profit organizations, non-for-profit organizations, even public administrations, and pretty much every single sector is represented. Luxury, transportation, energy, healthcare, insurance, financial services, you name it. Designing new narratives for the future, designing memories of the future works and is of utmost interest for any organization that sees very vividly that the time has come to reconnect the biosphere with the anthroposphere. I'd like to leave you with a quote by US politician Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She sums it up. We can't be what we can't see. Designing new narratives of the future is the necessary step to imagine new ways of designing strategies, new ways of developing coalitions with other players, and ultimately new ways of making sure that humanity operates in a safe and just space. So here are four messages, hashtags, that I offer you to remember from this masterclass. Number one, beware of the official future. Beware of the notion according to which there is no alternative to simply continuing what we're doing today. I would venture to say that Margaret Thatcher was in fact wrong or should be proved wrong. Hashtag number two, great acceleration. 
Great acceleration means that we are right now, as humanity, exponentially growing in every aspect of our activities and we are triggering exponential changes in our biophysical environment with the risk of overshooting the planetary boundaries that you remember Johan Rockström introduced to us. Hence, hashtag number three, aim for a safe space. That is, working towards reconnecting human activities with the biosphere, which might, among other levers, build upon new accounting standards. Fourth and final hashtag, let's build collectively new narratives for the future. To change the present takes that we first change the future. To recognize new opportunities to reconnect the biosphere with the anthroposphere requires that we engage in this tremendous effort of developing and exploring new narratives for the future. Now, with that being said, I'm reaching the end of uh, my uh, few slides and I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your uh, attention. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. We have a first question. <coughs> Can you give an example of a company or a group that produced a new narrative and use it in, in new, and use it, sorry, to build a new strategy? Yes, sure. And I think that um, one example that comes to mind connect with um, a couple ladies that I uh, presented to you during the masterclass. You may remember Anne and Laureline working on the future of the mountains. Well, a couple of years ago now, there was this um, Jura-based um, ski resort called Metabier that made a critical decision with all the stakeholders brought together, including the ski lift operator, including the locally elected officials, including the non-governmental organizations, every single organization that had a stake in this ski resort ended up supporting an unprecedented strategy, which was to say, ski is going to come to an end. And we are planning for a strategy that integrates the prospect for our main economic engine to stop in 10 to 15 years. It took many rounds of discussions. It took many debates. But ultimately, those stakeholders successfully built up a coalition that stood behind this unprecedented strategy which would not revolve around skiing anymore. And this, to me, is a rather spectacular example of human activities going in a direction to reconnect with the biosphere and fully appreciate the diagnostics that they received from climate scientists and snow experts that explained clearly that this probably was a much more desirable future for this um, ski resort. Okay, uh, some more questions. Uh, yes, we have another question. What skills are needed to be an actor in safeguarding the future? Well, I think that um, this presentation probably convinced um, everybody or many people, I shall say, in the audience that we're talking about multidisciplinary skills. We've brought in the mix and we've gone through history together, recognizing the need for systems thinking. We remember the uh, MIT scientists work in the early 1970s. We recognized also the need for renewed economics with the example of going from Milton Friedman to Kate Rayworth. 
we recognized also the needs for building some understanding of climate and more broadly speaking earth sciences let's remember the planetary boundaries with Johan Rockström we also are bringing into the mix storytelling and story listening capabilities remember the words by um, Case von der Heiden that stories are very effective vehicles to help us engage with complexity and of course going back to the uh, Metabier ski resort example we need renewed strategic thinking competencies because we're talking here about designing unprecedented strategies that might revolve around a brand new relationship with what we consider to be of value and when we use the word value we go into yet another discipline that must be in the party that is accounting accounting is a fantastic discipline that opens up new way very operational very practical ways of reconnecting businesses with the planetary boundaries I have another question. What are the drivers of corporate awareness on this major topic? So this is a question that I've been asking myself for much time now. And the reason why throughout the masterclass I offered you to meet with remarkable people is that I increasingly recognize that corporate awareness begins with individual awareness. As Professor Pierre-Yves Gomez would say, there is no market economy. There are marketeers. Behind those abstract concepts, there are always people, individuals, with their own hopes, with their own fears, with their uh, family joys and troubles and corporate awareness ultimately is the sum of individual awareness. So I think that we are talking about a multi-level awareness, of course, not all of the pressure is on the individuals. The pressure may also come from regulatory devices, like I mentioned the vote by the European members of parliament on new reporting standards for multinationals but the individual transition is of utmost importance and it is possibly even more of utmost importance if we remember the social tipping point theory by Malcolm Gladwell which to make it short and simple states that it only take for a few percentage of the population to switch into a new mindset for the entire population to follow. So activating the individual awareness lever is probably equally as important as activating the accounting lever, for instance. Okay, and someone asking, uh, do you have any advice if you want to, to go further on the subject as individuals? Well, if, if anyone is interested in um, finding ways to be a change agent towards safeguarding the future, it probably starts with reconnecting with nature. And I thought some time ago that this advice was a bit simplistic, but it really is not because reconnecting with nature or reconnecting with who we are as a spiritual individual is a necessary step towards reconsidering who we are as human beings and what we want as civilizations. So I'm using here big words like civilization or humanity, but this is the result of the accumulated power that human kind has acquired. The subtitle to this masterclass 
brought in focus the word Anthropocene, mm. which is still debated by the geologists, but it is eventually a new geological epoch that would have started in the mid 20th century. So what Anthropocene simply says to us is, look, human beings have becoming so powerful that they are now a geological force. If that is the case, if as a species we've reached a global scale power, well, we probably need to go through a deep thinking about ourselves. Hence, reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with our emotions, regaining also some spiritual space and asking ourselves for real what should it mean to be humans? <clears throat> we have no more questions. <coughs> have you something to add to conclude this masterclass? Well, the one thing I would add is uh, um, that Probably in addition to the skills and competencies that we discussed, um, I would probably add that of curiosity. I think that it is of utmost interest to all of us to consider our lives as an ongoing query into the marvel and the beauty of nature, into the marvel and the beauty of who we are as a, as a species. And it probably takes this curiosity and it probably takes this willingness to consider new narratives to ultimately find ways to truly set us up for a sustainable future. I think it will take that we become a bit, um, well, indisciplined and willing to acquire new knowledge also in unconventional ways. Knowledge can be acquired every day. It can come to us through our brain. It can come to us through our body. It can come to us through our heart. And I think there is nothing wrong with recognizing that there are multiple complementary ways of acquiring knowledge, possibly acquiring some wisdom, and possibly then turning ourselves into change agent towards safeguarding the future. Thank you, Thomas, for your availability and for sharing this new reflection with us. And um, thank you all for your participation. We will meet you on February 1st for next uh, masterclass. The topic will be the governance and it will be with uh, Peter Wirtz. Thank you.